Well, hey, everybody, and welcome. My name is Jake Milstein from Critical Insight. And today we're talking about the state and local cybersecurity grant program, which is and the notice of funding opportunity that came out. Um, and the uh, I don't know if you all got a chance to read the document that came out, but we sure did. And it was 93 pages. Um, and I don't know about you. You know, I love reading a giant 93 page document uh, from the federal government. It's what we do in our spare time. No, seriously, uh, we're glad to have you all here um, as folks get in the room. A um, couple of quick notes, you know, one is if you have been to our events before, you know that we try to keep them lively. We try to answer questions in the chat. Uh, so on the right hand side, there is a chat. Um, go ahead and tell us where you're joining from. Uh, I am joining from a basement in Seattle, which is where I've been since March of 2020. Um, and uh uh and you know the you know we've been waiting obviously for this um uh notice of funding opportunity to come out for a long 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 time um and you know one of the things that we're going to talk about today is like why is this taking so long and what is now going to take so long before people get get money um and and get all of this so we'll head into all of that all right um looks like we have folks in the room we'll begin okay so number one chat's on the right i said that you can mute the chat if you want if you're getting too many bloop bloop bloops which is the uh which is well what it sounds like there's a little uh, uh icon at the top of the chat that looks like a bell if you click that it will mute the chat um everybody who registered will get a recording of this it'll be automatically emailed to you by the system um, we all know that systems only work so perfectly. So if you don't get the recording, feel free to email me, jake at criticalinsight.com, and I'll send you a recording. Um, but if you're one of those folks who you plan to be here for the whole thing, but you got to leave after five minutes or somebody calls you or something comes up, and I know for none of you in your jobs would anything ever come up and interrupt you and what you plan to do today, um, you know, it'll, it'll get you a recording. Um, we're going to talk about the last briefing we did on this. We're going to talk about uh, what we've learned that's new, and we're going to talk about the path forward, give recommendations on what you should do, um, and give some predictions. Um, who are we? Critical Insight defends critical services against cyber attacks. We uh, serve municipalities, cities, counties, tribal organizations, um, and we are their 24-7 security operations center. We provide cybersecurity as a service, which means we provide risk assessments, pen tests, uh, and uh, uh, and help folks with incident response, which is never how we want to meet anybody. So we'd love to meet you before uh, you know you 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 would need incident response. Uh, joining me today, um, Mike Hamilton, Dan Wardell, John Traeger. Um, I'm going to have everybody introduce themselves. Mike, go ahead. Uh, hi, Mike Hamilton, founder of this company, and have spent about 10 years doing security and government. Awesome. Dan. Hi, I'm Dan Wardell. I'm the information security officer for the city of Spokane and have had a, a wonderful, long relationship, very successful relationship with Critical Insight. Thank you. And John. Hi, I'm John Traeger. I uh, recently left the city of Squaw uh, in early retirement. Well, OK, it's not my retirement, but anyway. Uh, and I was a city council member there years before that. I've also been in, in lots of different industries, transportation, healthcare, e-commerce, and I'm doing cybersecurity consulting at this point. Great. And my name is Jake Milstein. As I mentioned, I host all the events for us and can be the nexus for any information you need. If you if you have a question after this and you didn't get to ask it, send it to me. I'll make sure you get an answer either from us or someone else. And I will put my email address in the chat uh, in just a second. Um, Mike, go ahead. OK, so th this is actually the third dive we've done into it's coming. Here's what it's probably going to be. And a lot of the information that we presented before uh, came from my friends that work in state emergency management, which is the state equivalent of federal FEMA uh, and uh, folks in DHS. So they gave us pretty good indication of what was coming. So let's just review what we said before. Uh, yes, the states are going to receive funding from FEMA and distribute that. Emergency Management Division will be lead agency. At least that's true in our state. I can't speak for all states. Uh, 
uh, when local governments required to justify and apply for funds, there's some nuance to that now that we've read the, the NOFO, the no, Notice of Funding Opportunity. Um, um, th there will be a justification process that is communicated, and we're going to talk about probably what that's going to look like. Um, and there will be a committee that will be developed. This is this continues to be true. Next slide, Jake. Um, there are rules as to what you can and can't do with the grant funding. Um, some of the um, uh, the requirements and rules are. 80% of that funding has got to go to local government. So the states are going to receive the funds and they have to d distribute 80% of that to local government. 25% of that 80% goes to rural local government. Um, there is going to be a cost sharing requirement that you can get around if you team together with multiple jurisdictions. As I read the NOFO, I, it's not clear because this thing is full of Fed speak. The first half of this is almost indecipherable. The second half is readable. Um, so the jurisdictions teaming may mean states that do the same thing. I don't know. There's that's, a, that's still a little bit of a question. They will distribute a template. That template, I think, is going to be the application process for local governments. And in our state, it's going to be state level CIOs, CISO, um, that's going to be part of this committee. All true. So we got that right. Next one. Hey, uh, Mike, real, real quick, before I go to the next one, mm -hmm. the committee. So the committee, the team, like who who gets to be on it? How to how how is each state going to figure it out? Does each state get to figure it out on their own? Well, there's a upcoming slide that enumerates this, but it's going to have state government. There has to be representation from local government. They want public health involved. They want education involved. And I think they're just going to tap some experts to create this committee that will develop the state's plan. Okay. There's the next slide. There we go. Uh, this is what we said last time too. All this still appears to be true. No reason to really dive into this. Go ahead. And just for folks who weren't here before, cybersecurity monitoring, zero trust architecture, multi-factor authentication, IR readiness, and user training. Okay, so um, these uh, this is pulled directly from the Notice of Funding Opportunity, and I've converted it to language that's a whole lot more consumable than uh, what's in there. Um, so the states are being funded right now to develop uh, a, a statewide plan. They want it to be as close to an all of state strategy as possible. Step number one is to construct a committee that's going to build that plan and they have a year to do it. And again, the committee is going to draw from, you know, what I said, state government, local government, and it's going to have to be large and small local government, rural local government, uh, and education. And here's the thing local governments have to consent when this plan is developed yeah we're on board with that and there will be very likely a uh, a, uh, a list of things that are allowable uh, and some strategic directions that we need to go in but again if you want the funding you got to sign on to whatever plan the state comes up with um, and the plan has to be measurable because Homeland Security has got to go back to Congress and say, here's how the money got used and it was successful in moving the needle. Uh, any questions there, anybody? Okay, go to the next slide. Those slides are changing awful slowly. Okay, so right now, money has been allocated right now for the states to develop the plan. And in order to get the money to develop the plan, the states have to go to grants.gov and go through what looks to me like a really convoluted process to apply for the funds that have already been allocated. So here in Washington state, we have about $3.7 million to conduct the planning. That's the only money that's available right now, goes to the state to set all this up. Um, again, you know, all of state st strategy, the, uh, there are, are criteria in there set by DHS, and there is a number of outcomes that I'm going to go through in a minute here that uh, uh, need to be a byproduct of all this planning and then the implementation. And so, again, th those are the allowable expenses. Um, there's also rules about 
You can use the funds for hiring consultants. You can buy capital purchases. Uh, you cannot use the funds to supplant uh, something you're already paying for. You cannot use the funds to hire. You cannot use the funds to pay a ransom. Um, ordinarily, with the grants that I've handled before uh, in the public sector, you could not uh, encumber multi-year uh, managed services. There seems to be no prohibition in this particular grant. So those are just some of the rules that are pretty normal with you know FEMA type grants. Hey, and and I want to dig into that a little bit, sure. um, Mike. You know, when we when we did this before, um, you know, the question did come up because. Um, you know, insurance, cyber insurance premiums have gone up so much. And there's certainly we've heard of municipalities losing cyber insurance. Some people were hoping that they could use this to to pay for that increase in cyber security, but that, cyber, sorry, in cyber insurance. But mm -hmm. that that can't happen. Not on the list. Not one of the outcomes that they're trying to get out of this. So the, you're seeing the saying the state gets to do more granularity. The, the feds are setting the boundaries. It must be at least this turf. And then the state could get very, way more specific as to what they want. Um, you know, the question for small jurisdictions is how complicated is that ask from the state where we get funding? And, and John, what do you expect there? I mean, do you think that, do you think each individual state is gonna get really granular and say, we want you to focus, you know, just on MFA, or we want you to do something very specific? What do you think is going to happen there? Yeah, I think that's a possibility if, if they have good grip on what is happening in their state, where the biggest holes are, mm -hmm. uh, and the most important funding to make, like, yeah, you know, user behavior, MFA are huge, especially in smaller jurisdictions that just haven't had a chance to make the change. Um, and maybe the muscle of the state will be needed to convince the non-technology users that we this is serious. Inconvenience is required. Sorry, but we have no choice. Uh, because if you try to do it at a local level, it sometimes just seems to bounce off certain user groups. And and do you think and so you know one of the things that I'd heard of is a couple of cities having trouble with MFA because they have unions and the unions have said. Uh, no, you can't use, you know, you, you can't have our folks, you know, use their, their personal cell phones. So, you know, do you, do you, you know, do, will this help in dealing with problems like that for folks who haven't rolled out MFA? It could, if they, uh, if the funding could be used to provide, you know, mobile devices for MFA to employees, because that's the rub, right? They don't want it on a personal phone. And I've certainly seen it. Uh, I'm sure a lot of other cities have to deal with that, um, but that's a major yeah, cap. You know, from, a, study, so. from, from a local government perspective, though, we can, you know, if we can buy that 30-year-old technology called that USB key fob that had that six character, they don't have to use a phone. There's ways to get multi-factor authentication to everybody's pocket, even if there's somebody who says, I don't want to use a personal cell phone. And with regard to the state and public records request, if you deploy that technology correctly and train your folks how to use it, you would never have a record left on somebody's personal cell phone. So there, there's nuances on how to deploy it. And within the objectives that they've listed in the document, uh, our state, you know, the state of Washington is going to need to come up with what those outcomes look like and how we want to measure it. So, you know, it's, it's not only do they have a plan, but they have to state those outcomes and then they have to put some measurements around them. So it'll be interesting what we do. And in many cases, these basic security components like MFA are achievable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So and do you see the state doing a, sort of a vendor lock in like a UV key or some other tech for, that's for below a certain level? If you don't have something already, you have to use X and they'll pay for it. Maybe. Right? So you've got a lot of small jurisdictions like, well, it's free. State says I have to. Yeah, but you know that that runs afoul of the private sector. If somehow they are going to designate a single technology as the allowable one, right? That means they're going to dilate this process with this probably enormous competitive procurement, you know, thing. Mm -hmm. So it's I, I, I don't think they're going to be prescriptive about the technology. They're going to say you have to implement MFA. Okay, city, what's how do you propose to do this? What's the number? Okay, that's okay with us. Here's your money. I think I think that's how it's going to go. Yeah, I would, and, I would and, agree and, with that approach. 
And I was going to say, Aaron in the chat brings up an interesting question here. And 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 by the way, we have some more slides to go because there's a 96 page notice funding here. Yeah. But uh, uh, you know, Aaron says, I wonder if certain states won't even be able to jump through the hoops to get the funding. You know, I I do actually happen to have up, you know, the 96 pager here, and so it is all of the states, and this is the amount of money they get over here. Um, but it's also, you know, Virgin Islands, American Samoa, Guam, and Northern Mariana Islands, right? So, you know, Mike, what do you think? What happens if certain states won't be able to jump through the hoops? I, I, I don't know if it's, well, so the, the hoops, you know, it's, it's a whole lot of administrative work and, you know, coming up with the plan and as, as, as tightly defined as it is in the NOFO here, you know, I mean, they're going to... Homeland Security is paying for that to happen. So if if the hoop is financial, well, that's taken care of. If the hoop is we need human resources to do this and they're not available, that could be a problem. Uh, otherwise, I think it's possible. But the thing that I've run into, and I was in Idaho yesterday, and I was talking to the folks there about this, a lot of them from government. And because of the friction between uh, the state capital uh, which apparently uh, spends a lot of resources on itself and the rural and other jurisdictions in the state that are a bit starved of resources to listen to them. It's not likely that a lot of local governments are going to sign on to any state plan just because they have this attitude. And, you know, I mean, it, that comes from somewhere um, and probably over a long time. But I think there may be other states where there, there's that same kind of friction. Yeah, yeah, I imagine I imagine that's true. So we're going to come back to some of these allowable expenses because I have more questions, but I also want to be able to give folks the, uh, uh, you know, all of the information. Mike, you want to keep going here? Okay, here's the stuff that has to be in the plan. Um, you know, and this is a very basic thing. When we get to the outcomes, um, I think it's going to be a lot more clear what they're going to have to try and plan, but they're going to have to have rules and responsibilities. There will be the required elements in the plan, right? Everybody has to have multi-factor authentication. Everybody has to train their users. I mean, it's the normal stuff. Um, it, and it largely aligns with the NIST cybersecurity framework, but they just spelled it out in some detail. Um, there will be some discretionary elements. If states want to do a little more, they're going to allow for that. Um, they're going to have to do a capabilities assessment, and I think that's going to apply to the local governments, right? How do you, you have to be assessed to see where your gaps are. And this is something we talked about in our previous presentations. Uh, there's got to be a plan how we're going to do this across the state. What are all the projects going to be and how are we going to measure this so that we can report back on success or lack thereof? Mm -hmm. Now it comes. Okay. Here's the good part. This is what I think is a good part. And again, this has been rewritten a little bit to make it more understandable. So a governance structure so that we can um, measure as time goes on. Now we have X percent with everybody doing multi-factor authentication. So those are the kind of things that, that Homeland Security once reported up as a result of uh, uh, accepting the grant funding. Um, there will have to be uh, somebody designated to be responsible and accountable for specifically policies, but processes and procedures as well. Um, obviously, everybody has to have an incident response plan and it has to be exercised regularly, right? So again, you can outsource that. That's an allowable expense. Um, device inventory conducted regularly. This is where maybe a piece of technology will help. Um, prioritize things by risk so that if your network gets flattened, you know what has to come up first, what's most important to you. Next slide. Boy, what's up with the network? Should be up there. All right, annual risk assessment. Um, and an annual risk assessment, which again is just the stuff we're supposed to be doing anyway, but results need to be uh, contributed to a nationwide review. Again, so we can measure how are we doing? Are we coming up with this? Um, CISA vulnerability scanning, they wanna scan your perimeter and there's already a lot of jurisdictions already doing this, this is very useful. In fact, I think Spokane, aren't you one of them? Yep. Yes, we are. Uh, manage your vulnerabilities. This is, now we're starting to get into a hard part here because this is very people intensive. And 
including the, the ones that CISA publishes that say, these are the ones that are commonly exploited, they gotta be handled. Um, monitoring, absolutely, at the user and network level. Got to tease that out of language, but that's what it means. So they definitely want monitoring going on so that you can detect when your preventive controls have failed and then get after it because you exercised your incident response plan. Next slide. And I see that there are questions in the chat. We're going to get back to uh, we're going to get back to them after we get through the uh, outcomes here. Go ahead, Mike. OK, um, I'll, obviously able to respond to incidents, right? Right after monitoring comes response, right? Identify root cause and share. Who are partners we share with? I don't think that's really been defined. They said partners, you know, for me, that's the fusion center. That's my contacts in state government, et cetera. Obviously multi-factor authentication. This one's gonna be hard. End your use of unsupported or end of life software and hardware. The tech debt in local government is atrocious. And so this is a good thing, but it's gonna be hard to pull off. Um, prohibiting both through policy and review, the use of passwords that are no good, default passwords, fixed passwords that never rotate, um, and you know, periodically uh, give that a check to make sure that's still true. Um, and then ensure that if you've gone through incident response that you can actually actually reconstitute things using your backups. So part of the response plan is a, if we're completely down, we go to the backups. Backups have to be tested periodically too to make sure that that will work. Yep. Uh, okay, last one, uh, train your people, both uh, awareness training and phishing training, which I have an attitude about. I don't think it's very useful. Um, and also, as you are bringing up the skill sets within your organization, send employees out to get training, go to conferences, things like that. So money's got to be set aside for that as well. And seemingly the grant's going to pay for that. And then... And, and wait, before you get to the next one, I got to tell you, if you saw me smiling in the background, it's because David said, by the way, users are not patchable. <laughs> <laughs> No and firewall I, and, for gullibility. And I and I just wanted everybody to know that I appreciated that. I if I could you. do a thumbs up in the chat, I would have. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, and then adopt the nice. So this is the NIST education framework for workforce development. Okay, this thing, one of these things is not like the other. Um, I understand the sentiment here. How this is implemented is. A mystery to me so far and maybe you guys have some ideas on how that one's what so out. what what is the nice cybersecurity workforce framework it defines the key skills knowledge and attributes of all of the roles in cybersecurity analyst auditor you know uh, offensive security and uh those are the um kind of the the benchmark skills that NIST says you have to have to be in one of those roles. I think that's the simplest way I can put it. Got it. Okay. Um, and we're going to get into Q&A here. Uh, and there are a lot of questions in the chat. Uh, and so I'm going to stop sharing and get to those. Uh, one of them is, since cybersecurity plan is required, any idea on the timeline? How long does the state have to complete that plan? One year. Um, and I mean, based on everything you said, creating that plan is, is, is really hard. I mean, you have to get buy-in like, uh, do you, so two questions, one, you know, do you think any state has a leg up on it and has already started? And, and number two is, I mean, do you think anyone will do it early and what happens if somebody doesn't do it in time? Well, I believe that our state has already been working on this. I mean, I, you know, I was getting information about this and, you know, what the potential composition of our committee could look like, things like that. I can't speak for other states, but I would imagine that since especially emergency management um, at the state level knew this was coming, they had to be getting ready for it. Yeah. Just Dan, do you have any insight on that? Uh you know, our, our emergency management group indeed has been involved already and uh, gave us heads up a few weeks ago that this is coming, watch for it. Um, and I just kind of want to go back and reinforce that the state has a year. That first year is planned. 
according to the multi-state ISAC snap brief that's going on right now, I've got a feed coming in on that on another monitor. It, that, that first year is to build the plan. And then the out years is to execute that plan um, uh, intended for uh, permanent project, you know, pertinent project. So out years, years two, three, four are pertinent projects. Year one is development. Uh, I, for the state of Washington, they seem to be fairly well stationed to respond to this. It'll be interesting, though, as they reach across the state. We're a large state from a heavy metropolitan to rural area. So how do they balance that committee that's going to do the planning? And, and that'll be some of the things that I know I'm going to be watching for, because if it's uh, no bashing across the state, but if it's all based out of King County, it might have a certain flavor and it's going to miss rural the, the other half of the state, which is more rural and spread out. Yeah, and just so everybody knows, because not everybody here is from Washington, you know, and we're talking about the whole country, you know, when, yep. when, when Dan is talking about King County, that's where Seattle is and the population center of Washington state. I think, you know, every state has has this issue of having a, you know, having one or two or three urban centers. I know, you know, I lived in California for a long time and there was a lot of complaint that all of the money uh, went to Sacramento, uh, uh, Sacramento, Seattle, Sacramento, San Francisco. Francisco and LA, uh, and then other jurisdictions were uh, were were left out. Um, you know, Aaron says, you know, what's the timeline here? Is the is is it the state that the state gets the money by the end of the year, and then the timeline, and then what's the timeline for them to pass it down? Well, they're going to take a year. They're going to develop a plan. They're going to submit the plan to DHS. DHS is going to bless it, um, and then um, I believe they. And, and part of the plan may be determining up front what the costs are going to be so that they can submit the plan along with a price tag. And I think soon thereafter, it, the money's got to flow. Money's been appropriated. It's ready to go. So it's the duration of the flow to the city. So, for example, if your technical debt includes major rehash of your financial system, that's not something you can do in a year. That's a two to three year idea. Yeah, but you could allocate the money for a three-year project. You can. Correct. Yeah, you would have years two, three, and four of this time span. Right. And that is uh, allocated in this document of when, what's the execution timeline for this. This really goes out to 26. Yep, yep. Which takes me to Annie's question. Is this is an, is this an annually, annually renewable grant program? A lot of monitoring, uh, a lot of software are purchased and renewed on an annual basis. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not renewable and it's got a four year lifespan with the first year being the planning year. So we're talking about three years and what I didn't see in the NOFO is any requirement for sustainability of anything. So it, it's a question in my mind. So, you know, you can't hire with the money. So, you know, you got to do, let, let's say monitoring or whatever managed services are going to be your friend. So you can encumber funds for the three years. What happens after that? And that's that's a question. Yeah, yeah your funding strategy you had for to, 2027 would be if a you if you added staff with the money, you had to prove that you could carry them beyond the end of the grant. Which how you do that is a whole other question mark. But I did see that in there. You know, but but for those agencies with tremendously outdated software, tremendously outdated hardware, if they could do that uplift and then get themselves on a program that they have understand what that maintenance schedule looks like. For their organization in 27 and 28 this would be a great lift to securing our you know the, the whole sure country would. yeah it sure would you know and then yeah. if they know what that's going to be then they can budget for it and they can you know raise right. a bond you, you've got do? years to get that budget planning in place right. it's not a surprise mm -hmm. um hey just real quick one of our team members uh anna is doing a great job in the background um and she's putting a bunch of the resources on a on a uh, on uh, you know, for us at a link. Um, I put that link in the chat. If people want to read the 93 page NOFO, yeah, go for uh, it. you are, you are, you are more than welcome to. Um, so a couple more questions from the chat here. Uh, Dan, can these grant funds be used for cybersecurity initiatives that have been implemented recently? No, 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 no. You can't go that back in time. Planting. The, yeah. This, this is only for initiatives going forward. So, you know, in our case, we're, actively cleaning up the last of our MFA deployment. I don't get, I don't, these funds can't cover year two and three of my FMA pro, uh, multi-factor authentication program, mm -hmm. not an option. 
and you can't and and if you just recently hired somebody you can't supplant their their Great their salary. Uh, their salary with it or their benefits or anything else aaron says you know i guess i'm still confused is this money that we won't see until 2024 or later guys the way i understand it is it could be that you know real you know one of the states is ready to go has you know magically comes up with a plan by the end of this year is ready to roll it out at the beginning of next year and could be giving money out at the beginning of next year could happen unlikely because politics but unlikely but but could happen right wrong yeah no that's my sense too well yeah. you know and one of the challenges with this may, might also be the blessing is this this 100 page document is so structured you cannot wiggle out of the guidelines which is in one way an avenue to restrict misappropriation of funds. It, it's not going to be grabbed by a council member or a committee to say, oh, this money came in. Now we want to spend it this way. They don't have the option. So it, it is narrowly defined to stay within the cybersecurity swim lane and to increase the security posture of your organization, which does help, unfortunately, the burden of, of understanding these rules and following and doing four years worth of reporting is a little painful. Yeah, but this is the kind of thing you need when you're going to council, asking them for stuff that is, you know, in their eyes, back end infrastructure, which is like the last thing they want to spend money on. So this is really valuable for organizations that have a hard time getting funding for hardware, major software and so on. So, so and going back to Aaron's question about timeline. You know, this seems like, I mean, this is this is very frustrating for a lot of folks, right? They, the bill was passed. They, you know, thought they'd be able to get money. I, I know that there's at least one uh, port that I talked to that was hoping that they would be able to get money by the end of this year. I mean, this has been a very frustrating process and they hoped that it would, that it would go faster. Um, you know, you know, it, so what, so what can, and what can a city county port do right now to make sure that they're first in line should they be talking to their state should they be doing assessments should that what what should they be doing should be trying to get a seat at the table of that committee definitely and uh, i mean to an earlier point rural representation on that committee is a key to success here absolutely Mm -hmm. um, and along with what you can do right now is begin not an over analyzed risk assessment, but you can start that gap analysis. Yeah. So there's the national cybersecurity, the, the NCSR assessment. If you haven't enrolled in the NCSR, it's going to be required going forward. Go ahead and start it now. It opens up October 1st for those who are interested. So check, reach out to your multi-state ISAC find out where that uh, NCSR registration is and get registered, that will help you with your first gap analysis. What processes are more mature and what systems do I have nothing in place to handle? And that's a self-assessment, right? It is a self-assessment, right. but it's part of, interestingly enough, the guide for this is that you are doing assessments and NCSR is directly listed here. So that's an easy lift that would probably take less than six to eight hours of your organization's time to walk through their 150, 200 questions uh, about a self-assessment of where are we? So that's a good starting place. If you haven't done that yet, you need to start. The NIST framework is called out in there too. And I think assessing yourself against the NIST framework uh, ultimately is uh, gonna be more than acceptable as well. And the NCSR is based on the NIST. Mm -hmm. So if you do the NCSR and that NCSR is meant to be an annual thing. So you do it this year, do it next year, and it begins to track your progress. And then it rates you or ranks you with similar size governments and organizations across the country anonymously. So it's not, nobody's tagged on this, but you get to find out your maturity level based uh, uh, on other organizations of similar size and location. Yep. Lots of lots of questions here in the chat. Annie saying, I'm wondering if it's that strict talking about, you know, the, 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 the rules. Um, it may actually be a disincentive for states that have some form of safe harbor laws for business that check the minimum box of cybersecurity. What do you think? I don't think I understand the question. 
if uh, they already established a, you know, a minimum, are they going to allow them oh, to continue that? Or does that have to change? Does the state going to have to say no more safe harbor? Now you're in the political realm. I don't know if the state can influence what happens in business. You know, I mean, this state agencies and now local governments, um, I understand the safe harbor for business. I, I, I don't I don't think it's applicable. Um, and then Paul says, you know, there if the grant application that you can already download from grants.gov meant to be for the state to apply, um, then we'll have to apply directly from the state after they release a NOFO. That's that's right, right? What's up uh, now is for the state to apply. Right. And I, you know, I think I think they're gonna end up with a template, right? When the state comes up with their plan, they're gonna go, okay, locals, here's the template. What are you missing? Send that back, and that's what they're going to fund. That's the way I think it's going to go down. They're trying to make this as easy as possible, and notably, they're trying to put a whole lot of responsibility on the state rather than the locals, right? It would not be so if Homeland Security said, "Here's a grant program. All you local governments, come to us with what you need." Homeland Security can't scale. That's there's ninety thousand local governments in the United States. There's only fifty six states, territories, etc. So, you know, having all this uh, emphasis on the state, especially to do the reporting and the follow up, you know, I think they're making it as easy as they can. You know, and that being said, uh, and not to burst someone's bubble, but it, it, other states will probably have had similar experiences when you talk about your uh, cities and counties trying to reach out and get input from the state. And they sometimes fall short of responding and, and carrying through. Uh, I, I know I've been bit by that. and my hope is that our state of washington really embraces this and gets that plan in place uh, because that communication gap from state to local governances has been spotty to be polite but it does look like there's funding for them to have staffing to administer this yes. program that's included so the state doesn't have to cough up staffing to run this they they're funded by the feds so that's helpful yeah thank goodness and and um uh, Patrice says, please clarify. I read that the applicants have 60 days to apply. Who is that deadline on the states or local governments? So if states have one year to develop their plan, when does the 60 day deadline take effect? I think it's after they hand you the template and say, show me what you have slash need. You know, again, I think making easy, um, you know, assess yourself so you know how to answer quickly. But it's after the state develops their plan, they go, OK, here's the way we're going to do it locals here's your menu what do you need um and then you have 60 days yep and then vince says if all the 2022 money is spent on planning at the state level does that still count as the 80 percent local government passed the requirement mm. doesn't that requirement start with the whole funding and they don't have to do that for the plan john you're the city council guy how's this gonna that's, work? The, that's the way i read that but that is uh outside of this upfront money to the state to make a plan so that's separate from the billion dollars for our state or whatever it's going to be and then 80 percent of that has to go outside the state offices because they have their own technical deficits and things they need to spend money on so they get 20 percent to handle that piece uh, and the rest goes to all the smaller jurisdictions. That's the way I read it. But uh, again, I'm not a lawyer. Just play one on TV. So the um, uh, then Dale asks, what's the definition in the bill for rural? Um, I don't think the bill has a definition for rural. But one of the really interesting question is, what is the definition of, you know, who are the entities? And I'm pulling it up here. Um, uh, b because there were there's been a lot of questions uh, or sorry, mm -hmm. this is who the planning uh, committee has to have. And then elsewhere in the plan, it has who the I'll find it and I'll pull it back up. What what counts as a local government or what counts as somebody who can get this? Uh, because one of the questions from we, we work with also a lot of uh, healthcare. One of the questions is, can hospitals apply for this? Um, and 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 guys how did you read it in terms of who can apply for it and have you seen a good definition for rural and i'll look for well, one i did I see one in there the rural definition was fifty thousand uh population and then there was another caveat there about the region you're sitting in apparently so um that language i, I can't find it off the top of my head but i did remember seeing it but it was and i do remember 50 grand or under 50 grand is first requirement 
Mm -hmm. I think Homeland Security has got a very specific definition for rural other other than that. I, th I think, yeah, it's got to be a certain distance away from large population center, right, as well, because you don't just want a suburb. Mm -hmm. And this is so what I was talking about before is the definition of local government, mm -hmm. city, county, municipality, city, town, township, local public authority, school district, special district, interstate district, council of, lo of governments, regional or interstate government entity or agency or instrumentality of a local government. The reason I'm bringing this up is because I, I see we have some of our healthcare folks in the audience here who've asked if they can get it. Uh, you know, the way I read this is the special district i know i know of at least one you know hospital district that yeah. is planning that is hoping to get some money for this and i think um, that's in scope i think i think their use of the words special purpose district a whole lot of things fall into special purpose district los angeles has an air quality district that has taxing authority you know that that kind of thing would be in scope i, I don't know how they what they would do with this but um, yeah, and John, you just put something in the chat. Yeah, I found the language there. So it's 50,000 people and has, cannot have the designated urbanized area. So I believe like it's a cloud. We're not quite 50,000, but we have the urban area designation because we're on the growth boundary of King County. So we would probably not meet rural. I don't know what the population of Wenatchee is to answer Dale's question specifically, but there you go. And and so, you know, one of I want I want to go back to this question of, you know, I know I know because one of the questions that has come up many times is, you know, we'll get this burst of eventually someday we'll get this burst of money. But, you know, if let's say I go to a vendor and the vendor says, yes, you can sign up for my services, but, you know, it's a you know, it's a contract that lasts for several years you know, and you don't know how long you're going to get the funding for, you know, how do you reconcile those? How do you, how do you reconcile the need to have it for, uh, you know, a service for a long time? You don't want to just have it for a year. Um, and the fact that, you know, the money doesn't go on forever. Well, I mean, this is what we talked about. You know, you, you can do something for three years and during that three years, you got to figure out how you're going to sustain it yourself state. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, Dan. yeah, I see that representation on the committee. That's where it gets really important is to, you know, you've got to be able to push that. Yeah. That, how it was the continuation. If we we're just setting a baseline, how do we keep it there? Yep. 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 Um, and in terms of allowable services, you know, earlier somebody, somebody in the chat asked about, you know, si you know, large cities versus smaller cities. Um, you know, obviously they're going to be asking for different things. Right. So, you know, how do you how do you decide whether you want to hire tools or what? Sorry, whether you want to hire like an outside contractor to do things or buy a bunch of tools? You know, Dan, how do, how do you all make that decision? Well, you know, that that would be an interesting one. because As we look for how we do our long term strategic planning, that th this is something that goes in front of the mayor's cabinet and our council. Raising the level of visibility to th that this will for us for cyber, I think is going to help us with that long-term planning. I, I know every time I ask for a dollar, I've got to be able to say why the dollar should go to security versus police versus fire versus another organization within the city that all have tremendous needs. This at least gives us the opportunity to define what we think are, where our gaps are, get them filled, and then allocate or identify and communicate those costs going forward uh, it's going to be a long-term walk and it has been a difficult one getting critical pieces addressed uh, of our infrastructure so and actually I'm, i'll pause there and that and that statement and then come back with a question this might be more to mike and that is i don't see anywhere in this that it talks really about critical infrastructure we talk about our critical infrastructures water wastewater transportation it's interesting that that isn't specifically earmarked inside this document. Yeah. Well, I mean, I just think because of the existing definition, all of this is considered critical. I mean, the services that are provided by local government, right? Water purification. Almost everything is considered. Waste, all that yes. Stuff, that's all critical infrastructure. And the fact that they have health included here, 
that's critical infrastructure. So, you know, and, and the, the, the outliers that are not specifically associated with a local government, like a public utility, uh, those are in scope too. So, um, you know, I, I, they didn't say so in so many words, but I think a pre-existing definition brings that in. And, so and to I your know point that. about uh, local government, you know, dealing with councils, um, you know, this, there's an argument that this is an external threat, a big chunk of this driven by nation states or criminal out of, out of border or criminal organizations. And so there's an argument that should be pushed up the political ladder from cities, you should get mayors and then counties and everybody pushing the state to push the feds to say, this has to be, this is your problem, you guys. You know, you've got, you've, you guys have got the Russians in a snit. You guys got to deal with this and, and fund it ongoing because it's never going to go away. It's just part of your military expense, really, defense of the nation. Uh, I don't see that's been there. This is kind of a taste of it. Here's a few billion here to try to get that baseline up to where it should be for defense, but it's a long-term problem. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, 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 you know, I actually, I know that some, you know, water districts and, uh, and, and, and public utility districts were hoping that they would actually get some priority in this bill. Uh, I talked to uh, I, I talked to a water district that was really hoping that when, when it came out that they would get priority. Now, the states can still decide to give priority to, you know, a water district or a public utility district, right? Each state can make its own decision. That's my assumption. And maybe that's part of their assessment is like, oh, man, we have huge exposure on water mm -hmm. across the state. So we're going to beef that up a little more than financial systems or something to that and effect. Going, looking back on the planning committee piece and, and getting a seat at the table, not only do they have to allocate money to these critical components within our states, but some of these smaller organizations like a regional water district may not also may not have project planning. And so my hope is that they've allocated at the state level, our state, each state will need to allocate some level of assistance to help kind of structure that for these smaller organizations that don't have a technology project planner to help them onboard a project, execute the project and bring it to fruition. Uh, that those aren't simple tasks. It's easy to start a project. It's easy to get 50%. Uh, it's easy maybe to get 90%, get that last few steps and close out the project. This uh, uh, document requires that you make it all the way to the end. Yeah. And and hey, uh, uh, Brett brings up a question in the chat, you know, so I'm at a critical access hospital and clearly rural, you know, do I go to our local city mayor's office to make sure they're aware of us and add us to the list? So the, uh, I'll tell you the way I read this, because I, I, I've been looking at it for our healthcare uh, uh, folks for a while is it depends if you have a, an elected board. Um, and generally, uh, hospital districts have an elected board. If you have a board that is not elected, I think it's a harder argument to make. But by all means, go make the argument. <laughs> but, and I'll add to that too, um, and I, 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 don't, I don't see money is allocated for the state to do outreach, but I mean, there's going to be a lot of organizations in a state that have no idea this is coming. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a PUD in, you know, some very rural county, they don't know about this. So right. in, in order to bring them in, I think some significant outreach by the state is necessary up front to make sure that everybody knows this is coming. So, you know, they, they can raise their hand and say, I'm, I want to be in. You know, yeah. the time will come when they later they say, here's the plan are you in because you you know you have to accept the plan in order to receive funds so you know it's better though i think if everybody knows early on yeah but i mean you know go go by all means go raise a ruckus and and see i mean everybody knows that you know cities counties rural hospitals you know are facing the brunt of the cyber attacks and you know yeah um jason asks you know could maybe state county uh states or counties use money to establish shared services to be used by local government agencies like scaled out firewall services application services or is that not allowed with this grant i think if your state plans something like that it seems it would be allowable to me it's actually a good idea right i mean any economies or efficiencies of scale like that i think are going to be viewed positively and and there is a place in there where it talks about municipalities being able to work together 
to ask yep. for something in the grant, right, Dan? It, yes, it, yes, it is specifically there, and that drew my attention. And and so I begin to think, how am I going to collaborate with the counties that touch Spokane County, for example? And we sit in the it, it, right in the county seat. So how does the city of Spokane collaborate with Spokane County? Uh, we have 17 different fire districts that all connect in. So we've got a lot of collaboration that can occur just within our region. Yeah, and, 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 and I, this this plan specifically talks about that collaboration. And and I know in and I know in Idaho, I, I believe it's Idaho, one of the one of the hospital districts was gonna team up with the county that it's in to try to do uh to try to do an ask together. Um, Mike made an interesting point here too about reaching out to your emergency management coordinator. And if you don't know who your emergency management groups are in your in your state, uh, go find them. Uh, they should they should be willing to listen to us at this point with this landing and uh, for for our, the whole country. I think there's been good precedent for shared services. Um, if you look at any public safety, um, often you know the 911 is run by a county that's used by all the cities and they pay them a fee for it. So I don't see where there'd be any issue with you know the state providing shared services for small you know jurisdictions just don't have the funding to do sophisticated firewall or pick your service uh, and then that could be done um, you know it, it, of course every state there's either good and bad about their state it organization and how well they can deliver the service that's a whole other question or whether they just fund it and it's a third party service they offer up to the small cities for nominal fees yeah, yeah. Um, which is i think is a good strategy i think for for real shared services i think the heavier lift would be um depending on how it's done in your state um the development of interlocal agreements because those that that's sausage making mm -hmm. yeah, yeah yeah um and and so you know a couple of things um and and i want to answer some questions and i you know some of this is going to sound like i'm just talking about our organization but you know you can you, you can go to lots of cyber providers for this you know number one is we we are providing uh those assessments so if you want us to do an assessment uh so you can have have paper in hand and say these are the gaps uh you know you can come to us for those we'll do those for you we're keeping them at uh at a thousand dollars mike is leading that effort um the other thing is when you're when you're trying to figure out um you know what you can spend the money on you know, Mike has come up with services that Critical Insight provides. Um, so, you know, we provide the, you know, the full risk assessment. We prov we provide uh, uh, policy and compliance work, penetration testing, all of which is named in there, um, as is 24-7 monitoring, uh, incident response planning. Um, and, um, uh, Mike, anything, anything else on here on, on the services that we provide that you saw called out in there? Well, you know, you managing vulnerabilities, right? So, uh, when they say you need okay. to sign up for the CISA vulnerability stuff, that that's your perimeter. You're going to have to do vulnerability scanning internally as well. So we have a platform that does that. Um, you know, the things, uh, again, a lot of these things are things that you need to just do on an annual basis. So like policy review, that's called out in there. You're going to, you know, you're going to have to manage your policies. I mean, really, all of the things in there, if you needed to outsource them, that's what we do. Good. And we'll get to final thoughts here in a second. I do, you know, it, so if folks are interested in talking to us or if folks are interested in um, in that assessment that I talked about, um, my colleague Ginny is going to put a survey in the chat. Now, we want everybody to take the survey and let us know if this was useful um, because we get better based on your, uh, you know, based on your feedback. Um, so please take the survey. Um, and there's also a place in there where you can say yes, contact me about about any of this about any of the services and contact me for that thousand dollar thing. We can also help you write uh, your grant proposal um, when it gets to that point. Now we're all frustrated that unless it's, it's take just a so template long. to fill, fill out, right? Unless it's just a template, and then we'll see, right? Yeah. But so far, you know, I know we're all frustrated by how long this is taking, or maybe you're not frustrated, but. I know some people are about how long this is taking. So, um, uh, you know, we're happy to help you through the whole process. Um, let, let's, let's, were there any other, let me see if real quick, if there are any other questions in there. Um, 
let's see, if the state takes first year to develop the plan set up planning committee, locals won't see the template for their asks until after, until after that. So maybe a year away, right? As much as a year away, you know, I, I would hope that if they really wanted to knock this out, they get, they get this done in, you know, a quarter or two, you mm -hmm. know, something like that. I, I don't, I don't see this taking a year, honestly. I think they just gave them that much runway. I think, I mean, honestly, I think we'll see a lot of anger and blowback if somebody takes a full year at this point, but who knows, who knows? All right, let's do final thoughts. Uh, uh, John, you first. Okay, well, um, the state committee is gonna be really important in every state and how that goes will make a big difference in how easy or hard it will be for local governments to get the funding they need. Um, say I say start now on your assessment if you don't have do it regularly uh, and use the standards that look like what the feds are looking for because even if your state adds a few tweaks you'll be 90% there when the time comes uh, and the last one I had here is if you're looking at third-party security services as part of your solution you should probably start evaluating now start shopping now uh, so that doesn't eat up a bunch of time when you when the funding becomes available Yep. Yep. And, and again, I don't mean to sound salesy, but feel free to hit me up. Either we can help you or we can, uh, or we can recommend others or give you a list of folks who, who, who might be able to help you out. We got a lot of, we got a lot of friends in the business. Um, Dan, final thoughts. You know, uh, sign up for the NCSR if you haven't. Uh, that is that first level. You could spend six to eight hours. If you've never done it before, it's about what it takes to go through it on that first pass. There's a lot of questions there, but it's valuable. So that it's to echo what John said, you need to start your planning now. If our states move quickly and get plans out, you need to know what it is you would want to ask for. And it's it's not a complete wish list. So it is pretty well defined. So so start lining up what are those number one priorities? What are those that, that technology that you have deployed that's at end of life that needs to go away? You should you should have that asset list now. Uh, and, and the old software. And then you also need to start talking to your organization in, internally that there is the potential for us to receive this funding. And in order to do so, we need to have some of our house, not necessarily in order today, but we need to have a plan to bring our program, raise the maturity of our programs, retire old software, um, and, and put in vulnerability scanning and patching and, and all, and education. Uh, so, but that, I, I know culturally it takes time. You can't just say, well, here's some money and all of a sudden your organization is on board and they begin to all play well together. So start your communication internal, internally early. Good, good, great. And, and as somebody said in the chat also, you know, that allows you to manage expectations too. All right, Mike, final thoughts. Um, <clears throat> Even if there is a template that they're going to give you for just things to ask for, it's going to require a bunch of planning on your part. I mean, to uh, Dan's point just now, you know, a project plan and costing out an entire project plan to get something done is different than checking a box to say we need multi-factor authentication. So, you know, try to try to capture those costs as well as you can. And one final thing, I just my hope is that the states don't get bogged down in gigantic competitive procurement problems um, that they can do things like say okay we're gonna we're gonna let this go sole source you can go pick somebody or something like that because if 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 they're not prescriptive about a technology and then they say you got to go buy a technology but it has to be competitively done it's, it's just crankcase sludge all right well, on that happy note, um, I do want to say, you know, also, if anyone wants to get in touch with us, you can use that survey. Please fill out the survey. You can also get in touch with one of my colleagues who takes all of the incoming, uh, Ellie at criticalinsight.com. There's our 800 number. Um, and uh, um, thank you, everybody, so much for joining us. Special thanks to uh, John, Dan, Mike here uh, for being on the panel. Thanks, everybody. And as more as more information comes out, we'll share it with you. We'll have more panels. Um, and uh, we really appreciate you joining us today. Yep. Um, have a great beginning of fall, which is apparently tonight, just after 6 p.m. And Pacific, uh, have time. A Pacific time and have a great day. Bye bye. Right. And so comes the big dark. At the least in the Northwest. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. My eyes don't take sunlight anymore. <laughs>
<laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye.